Good morning. Good morning to you all. Or should I say muy buenos días? Así que estamos en Madrid. Well, welcome and thank you all for joining us for IAB Europe's uh, flagship event, Interact 2022 in Madrid. We are thrilled we can all be here back in person again, able to interact for real. And we are delighted you could all be here for what is said to be an amazing content for the next couple of days. My name is Charlotte Bricard. I work as a media journalist and an editorial director in France. So you can hear. Even though I am based in Barcelona. So if I do speak English with a bit of a Spanish accent, please be kind. Uh, I am the honor of being your host for Interact this year. As most of you will know, IAB Europe is the European level association for digital marketing and advertising ecosystem. Through its membership of IAB's national and media technology or marketing companies, its mission is to lead political representation, to promote industry collaboration across Europe. One of the ways they do so is by gathering people in events like this, which I want to thank you all again for joining. For over 13 years now, leading, advertiser, leading advertisers, um, industry experts, agency and media owners have come to interact, to meet, to get inspired, to share best practices, and with a central theme of diving into the next digital decade, we are thrilled we are going to share powerful insights and best practices. And we um, decided to reward you for taking time out of your busy schedules for joining us with a fantastic event, good food, and great company. I also want to give a special thanks to all of Interact sponsors this year who have helped make this possible. Just a bit of housekeeping before keep kicking things off. Uh, please make sure to turn any mobile phone to silence so we can keep our full attention on to speakers. And um, we will have a few sessions today where we will ask you to share any questions you have for our speakers. So please, do not be shy. Today, you are going to hear a um, stellar lineup of speakers, of moderators, of panelists across six sessions that will discuss everything from the latest ADEX benchmark to the economy attention and CTV through to retail media and metaverse. We will also conclude with a very special keynote as the CEO of IAB Ukraine will be here on stage in person today. So we encourage you all to stick around for, for that. I think I haven't forget anything. So without further ado, let's dive straight into the very first session of the day, where we will discover the heart of the press results of the latest ADEX benchmark, as I mentioned. For those of you who are not familiar, ADEX Benchmark is the definitive, definitive guide to advertising expenditure uh, that um, go through to 28 markets and details, formats and channels that drives um, the digital advertising annual growth. I am then delighted to introduce Daniel Knapp, EAB Europe's chief economist, who will walk us through the results that we have all been waiting for. Please welcome Daniel Klapp. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for the kind introduction. You could have just continued presenting the study. You already knew half of it already. Wonderful. Um, here we are. 
Um, the first time back after two years, the last two times I did this study was um, in my living room, um, crunching the numbers that many of you, many of you IABs, kindly shared with us. So this study, the Adex, Adex Benchmark study, is a collaborative exercise where 28 different IABs come together, share their market insights, and we synthesize this to put our industry, which sometimes likes a little bit of fluff and hyperbole, on a robust empirical foundation. And exactly that, in a long interact tradition, I'm going to do today. At, at the first glance, nothing has changed. We still have 28 different markets in our study. We're covering around 95, 96% of the overall European market, depending on how you define Europe. Here on the map, we just have the gray spots out there. But behind the scenes, things have become much more complex in trying to understand how our industry is growing. We increasingly have silos of measurement, silos of data, and data and insight doesn't travel very well between them. And that also has fundamental implications to how we size and understand the economy in which we operate. So, this wasn't me yesterday, but um, there is a significant complexity in doing this. Standards and definitions, they all vary between different markets, rates, gross, net, rate card. There are probably as many definitions as there are markets for these things. And we also realize that we can't just rely on surveys. We need to do extensive modeling and auditing the data to provide really like-for-like -like comparisons, in particular when it comes to the elusive long tail of digital advertising. Spend that doesn't go through agencies, that goes through the Amazons, that goes through other platforms, that go through retail media. And things get more complex as well, because the specter of inflation already kept knocking in 2021. So here you can see all the markets in our study that in 2021 had more than 5% inflation. And there are quite a few there. And you see a couple of benchmarks as well. Plus, inflation is going to rise. Probably Turkey, we're going to see around 70% this year. I'm saying this as a little prelude because when you see some of the growth figures shortly, don't be surprised and have a bit of a healthy skepticism in the, in the sense of we need to figure out what the currency conversion here really is. But with that, Let's dive right in to the markets. What is our market? How have we actually weathered the pandemic as we came out of it after two years? Now, after a 6.3% growth in 2020, no decline, we were forecasting back in October a fairly optimistic hard rebound of 28.6%. Now, the Mac clown has changed, but has the forecast changed? What are the actuals? Now, it is the few moments of pleasure in the life of an analyst to see that forecasts are actually being validated. We can see forecasts of the reality even exceeded expectations. Digital advertising in Europe in 2021 grew by 30.5%. The market has been propelled now to its highest growth since 2008. And that is in a very, very different environment of course, because back then the share of digital advertising was below 20% share of all media, and now we're approaching 60%. Major additions to this market, bringing us up to 92 billion euros. What is 92 billion? That is around the GDP of Ethiopia, or the entire organic food and beverage industry in 2020. That's the size of our market, 92 billion. And we added in 2021, nearly the entire size of the 2010 market to an already strong 2020, namely 21.5 billion euros. Now, growth isn't evenly distributed, and some markets help this growth more than others do. Indeed, we can see that the top three markets in our study capture more than 50% of overall European digital ad spend. We can see UK, Germany, and France really, really drive this. But that doesn't mean that other markets don't matter, because we see, as I show you in this presentation, quick second mover advantages of smaller markets. We're seeing rapid rise in growth in Eastern Europe in particular, and also in some other markets. And indeed, we should also zoom in on the nuances and the differences between those smaller markets that we see here in this longer tail, where we can see actually the difference between a Norway and a Hungary is significant difference between Greece and the Belarus is as well. Remarkably, all markets this year grew double-digit. This hasn't happened since 2008 as well. 
So we see a fairly consistent pattern actually with growth. Just look at the middle here, you can see the mid-20s being a very comfortable range in which many markets were growing. A couple of reasons for that. Number one, of course, the overall rebound that we saw, but also that um, trends and patterns with, with regards to e-commerce, um, growth of social platforms, etc., was fairly harmonious across regions and due to their high share that contributed to this overall growth. Which doesn't mean that if we look under the hood, there are structural differences and there are challenges with the local media ecosystem, for instance, in our markets that are hiding behind these numbers. But it isn't really a story of 2021 and a one-year recovery. We need to rewind a little bit and actually see that what we're facing right now, seeing is a, what I call the tale of two recoveries. Markets that were very resilient in 2020 typically had a much lower growth rate in 2021 and the other way around. And I think the Spain, our host nation, and Germany juxtaposition really demonstrates this, this, this quite well. Have a look at the left part of the slide where you could see Spain, due to severe hard lockdown was, and economic impact, actually was suffering also from an ad perspective and it was one of the very few markets um, or the, um, that actually declined during 2020. The rebound, the organic rebound was strong and Spain was one of the fastest growing markets in 2021. Go to Germany, it was exactly the other way around. Um, Germany weathered the pandemic fairly well, GDP was strong, and we saw the overall ad market performing quite well in 2020, but then underperforming the European average, which is the dotted line here, in 2021. Which means we need to take a look at a two-year recovery. So if we look at the growth rate in the rankings of the markets, we can see things are changing if we take this two-year perspective. Where again, we have a fairly harmonious growth, but we can see um, around 50%, 30%, etc. in markets like Germany, for instance, and Spain, which were nearly diametrically opposed in the previous slide, if you look at the right middle section of this slide here, have actually come much closer together. So this is a much more realistic perspective of how growth and the COVID pandemic recovery actually operated. Six markets deliver around three quarters of the overall net additions, i.e. new money coming into the digital advertising in 2021 versus 2020. And you can see these additions are incredibly high. For instance, if you look at the UK, France and Germany, these are nearly 20% or more of some of the smaller markets that we saw in 2021 overall market size. Um, these net, net additions came from various factors. Of course, there was the streaming explosion, which continued in 2021. Even now, the SVOD fatigue is already helping the digital advertising. We can see the e-commerce trend is persisting. Um, we can also see that um, we see new brands coming in, D2C brands who operate very differently, who have advertising higher on the balance sheet, where just stopping advertising when the economy isn't so well, hesitation doesn't really work because you need to fuel your overall business by perpetually advertising. These were some of the drivers that really helped us weather this two-year storm, which we see reflected here in the net additions. But that doesn't mean there isn't further headroom for growth. Indeed, if we look at digital ad spend per head, digital ad spend per capita, we can see huge differences between markets. Look at the UK, which where over 400 euros are actually being spent on digital advertising per head, and then look at the other markets. Of course, there are differences in terms of how large is the economy, how digital is the infrastructure, um, and how mature is the market, what, what's happening in other media like TV and so forth. But we can clearly see that if we look at some of the larger European economies in particular, there is a lag going on there that cannot be just explained away by these macro factors. And have a look at this, where we compare the UK indexed at one um, to the other parts of the big five club in Europe, around, along GDP, population, and digital ad spend per capita. And you can see actually that the differences are not that stark when it comes to GDP and population, but they're incredibly pronounced when it comes to digital advertising. So there is headroom for growth. There's a lot of work to be done in our industry to really provide infrastructure, measurement, confidence to make this happen. Markets vary in growth and maturity, and this is always one of my favorite slides because it tells so many different stories at once. The size of the bubble is the size of the market, and then we can see on the y-axis the growth of 2021, and then again, ad spend per capita on the x-axis as a sign of market maturity, i.e. how developed is the market. 
and the, dot and the dotted lines are the European averages. We clearly have, again, the UK as, a, in a sense, like a galaxy of its own, a breakaway nation when it comes to digital advertising, a clustering here of very mature, um, rich markets, the Nordics and Switzerland, forming their own cluster, kind of growing in line with the European average. And then we have a group of markets that are just, that are just breaking out in terms of maturity the, uh, when it comes to digital ad spend, Germany and others. But they're not growing harmoniously strong, the differences there. Then you have a 2021 laggard cluster on the bottom left. This is mainly because those markets in the CEE region were performing very, very strongly in 2020. So here it's mainly a comparison effect. Then you see the Turkey outlier rising to the moon. I'm recording my slide on the inflation. This is partly uh, due to that, but also due to a massive explosion in social media and a very, very high young population, um, the population size overall of 83 million people. And what we do in Adex as well is we dive into the formats. So what's happening behind these top line numbers? What trends can we see? What insights can we glean for our business strategy if we're buyers or if we're sellers? We start very crudely with just three different buckets. Search, classifieds, directories, and affiliates, a legacy bucket where if you see how it's shrinking, we might think of, revi of revisiting that. And then the elusive display category, which has many things in it. Banners, native, even audio is in there, video, social, and so forth. And we can see that the display formats overall, they continued their meteoric share gain from 2020, also in 2021, going to nearly 50% of the overall spend. And it's clear, we can see in 2020, if we look at the different formats, search was at first, p pretty impacted by the pandemic. We saw rise of um, social, where we saw social again being positive already in June 2020. Then performance video came, then branding video. And many of these trends actually carried through in 2020, where also many of the new businesses that have been launched in Europe, we saw a surge in SME um, startups, mainly digital endemics. They're relying on social and other self-serve platforms to propel their growth. So this, this, this is why we see the continuation of this trend. And with these 49.6%, display now exceeds 40 billion euros. So 45.6 to be exact, a 34.5% increase above the average growth rate that of 30.5% I mentioned earlier. Other formats are lagging behind. Display is over 50% of digital ad spend in a majority of markets. On the left, we can see the typical skewed curve, which markets um, are the largest. But it's quite interesting if you look at the shares on the right side, where you see many emerging markets, think of Turkey, think of Romania, that have a much higher share of display than search, um, which is different from the established markets. And this usually has to do, number one, with measurement. Maybe not all of the search spend is being captured, but more fundamentally, it is about that these markets as second mover markets have started to plan and use media differently when there were other performance alternatives already available on top of and beyond search. Social is a key driver of all of this, and social is 25% now of all digital ad spend in Europe. And that, incre that, that includes or goes up to 50% actually of the, I clicked a bit uh, faster here, 50% of the overall display spend. So, so, uh, so social is incredibly huge, but it's also driven by a huge diversification that we have in social now, with new platforms coming in, in particular when it comes to vertical video, with shoppable ads, um, in, in, in the sense of moving the ad exposure and the conversion into a single platform. These are all drivers which we clearly believe is going to increase the share of, um, um, of social further. However, one thing we note, and that is that the difference in growth rate between social and non-social display, the, the gap is narrowing, not widening. Meaning, number one, there is some sense of social saturation. And other channels are also performing well. Social grew faster than all other displays. We can see here on the left, we have again a recall of all the different formats that we have, search classifieds and, uh, and display. In, but within that, social is really the driver. So if we factor out social out of display, the overall display bucket would have grown lower, slower than search. 
and video, already mentioned it, with the new vertical video platforms, was actually the fastest growing segment within social. When we say 42% social growth, that is higher than, for instance, what Meta reported. The results came out, I think, last week, that was 39.7% year-on-year growth for Europe. So we are seeing something higher than this, which is coming, again, from other platforms than that on top of it. And video is driving it with a 50% increase. Overall, video is also important for display growth outside of social with a 46% increase. That includes YouTube, but it also includes local publishers, broadcasters, um, it includes in-stream video and outstream video, which we saw grow stronger than in-stream this year. So outside of social, there's also a sectoral shift towards video, which we, which we can see here. And video indeed now exceeds um, half of display spend in, over th in, in just three markets and has around about 41% share of, the, um, um, of overall display. Now, if we move away from the big display bucket and look at what's happening beyond social in terms of automation, etc., there's, of course, the question about programmatic. There's many definitions of programmatic as there are intermediaries and hops in the value chain, so it required a lot of contortions to actually provide a calculated like-for-like -like figure. Some IIBs include social in the programmatic numbers, i.e. have an automation number which is focusing more on workflows than where money goes and which protocols it actually uses to transact. We said that doesn't really help us drive the market and understand where it's going. So we really wanted to look at what's happening with spend transacted via the open RTB protocol, be it in a private marketplace or be it in the open market. So we did some calculations. And um, programmatic clearly outperformed IO-based display as in previous years, but the outperformance was a bit more pronounced this year. So programmatic, we think now, is around 12.7 billion euros worth in Europe with a 34% increase. And for the first time, we're breaking out programmatic numbers by country. So we can see overall 56% of display outside of social is now programmatic. And some markets are programmatic native or programmatic only, nearly, as, as you can see here, whereas with others, it's quite different. This isn't a value judgment, because different markets operate very differently, depending on how concentrated the sales side is, what programmatic is being used for, how agencies are employing it. There's a rise of EMEA-based buying hubs, for instance, where the, you know, how you account for spend is varying, etc. Also, we're seeing, if you look at the charts here, surprisingly, not necessarily the markets where programmatic launched out of the gate in Europe being the top of the list here, but it's often second mover advantage, uh, second mover markets, smaller markets in CEE, where we can see, for instance, in a, in a more fragmented landscape, automation tools are very important, but we can also see that standards of measurement, brand safety, and so forth, which have held back programmatic and caused hes and hesitation in the West for quite some time, although not being fully resolved, have created more confidence in, ad in, in adopting and plugging into a ready-made infrastructure rather than building this infrastructure from scratch. And this has helped these second mover markets to increase their share of programmatic fairly quickly. From programmatic to another format, which is uh, getting grown quite quickly, and that's digital audio. We're covering both podcasts and music streaming and news, and we think podcast is around 33% of the market. It's fairly consistent across the different markets in Europe, but you can again see the concentration is quite high, just to, um, of um, which markets are spending here, um, again, based on overall market size. But if you look at, in the middle, on the right side of the slide, you can see different patterns which don't highlight the usual suspects, where we can see actually Ireland with the highest digital audio ad share in Europe, followed, for instance, by Turkey, even Greece, Romania, and only then we have the Netherlands as a very mature market. Um, and also, um, w w w w when it comes to, uh, to, um, to growth, um, we're seeing a fairly kind of consistent double-digit picture, but something where we can see some markets are really exceeding the growth quite a bit. Outside of audio, if we move into search, um, we can see it's around 50% of ad spend in, um, in a few markets. Um, but um, we can see it is um, markets like Sweden, for instance, which are strong, UK, Netherlands, so legacy markets. Sweden is quite interesting because there was a move many years ago from directories to search, and we can still see this move actually persisting. 
Um, it, again, when it comes to classifieds, um, we are thinking about how to reclassify this, the classifieds, because increasingly a lot of classified sites are actually spending um, via display-based advertising, via programmatic. So the category isn't really that useful anymore, but we're seeing it still as a good bellwether for the overall economy and the rebound when it comes to jobs, used cars, um, etc. Um, and again, a, a consistent picture of growth, but a more heterogeneous picture because there were markets actually that only grew single digit. If we index all of this and say, which were the fastest growing formats against a base of one, which is the average growth of 30.5% in Europe, we can clearly see where the hotspots of growth are. They are in digital audio and social video, and then all other things come, but even programmatic is outperforming the average and is outperforming, is outperforming search. I think this is a very unique year of talking about um, addicts and spent numbers, not just because we can leave the baggage of the pandemic slowly behind us and we can see confidently that markets have recovered, but also because I think for many of us, we're more concerned about new clouds on the horizon and what the future of digital ads might hold. I might just dare a very brief outlook of how we think 2022 is going to shape up. And that, again, requires some geopolitical diplomacy because there are different forecasts depending on whom we include. We believe currently that all markets in this study um, combined will actually grow by around um, 10%. However, if we exclude the Russia and Belarus factor, it's just going to be 4.5%. So we can see um, with Russia around 6 billion, if we factor that out, if we factor out Belarus as well, there's going to be slower growth in the market. We're still optimistic that 10.1% can be achieved despite rising inflation, despite supply chain issues, despite the geopolitical issues, um, for a number of reasons. Number one, as I already mentioned, we have a very different structure of advertisers in digital than we have in other media. Meaning, we have many brands that can't just stop advertising. At the same time, we can see despite rampant consumer inflation, household savings have, um, have been quite high during the pandemic. So we're seeing consumers not necessarily stop spending, they're often burning off savings which isn't good news long term because it just postpones the crisis and Deutsche Bank currently expects that recession will hit us not in 2022, but in 2023. But it means it's a bit of a, um, um, it's a, bit of a um, party before the storm. We are still going to see growth in 2022. We might revise this forecast and I might not be as right this time as, uh, as last year. Um, there are too many factors involved. But I think we should remain optimistic that there is growth in our industry, and that if we unlock the value of formats, if we clean up supply chains, if we think about what digital advertising can do in terms of sustainability, if we also start um, to you know, unlock the growth of new formats in new walled gardens, think of retail media, think of um, app-based platforms, um, there's significant opportunity just in the paid media space of this industry, if not beyond it. And with that, thank you very much. I hope these statistics have energized you and given you some uh, information to query the panelists um, later on today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you for these truly incredible numbers. And would you mind staying a little bit longer? As I wanted to invite maybe Lisa Humphrey, the CEO of Coop M, to go for those this detail and discuss a little bit more this, uh, this insight. Lisa Humphrey, COO of Group MEMEA, please give her a warm welcome. Yeah? I think we do have seats. <laughs> we will be able to sit in a, in a second. Just, Lisa, first of all, can you tell us what in Daniel's presentation stood out in particular for you? Yeah, I, I think there was, there was a tremendous amount of insight, so it was fantastic to see the report. Um, I think the things that really stood out for me is the potential and the, and the growth. I really like seeing audio split out in that way, and it's, it's so interesting to see the stack rankings of the markets and how different they are for audio. And I think that really highlights to me the opportunities, excuse me, in the new and emerging areas where you really see the markets 
that come through, and then the second mover advantage for, for some of the other markets in the more established areas. So I think you know, it, this year is going to be very interesting. Danielle, you want to answer that? I agree, it's, it's going to be interesting. Um, there are many clouds on the horizon, um, and I think there are, there are issues that we have to resolve as an industry to really legitimize all the advertisers that we um, can continue to grow um, as an industry. And I mentioned supply chain issues, for instance, in, in, in programmatic. I think um, we are on the verge of a, of a splinter net where the internet that, that you could address everywhere is being fragmented into different walled gardens, which is reducing reach, it's reducing comparability, and it's putting an onus on advertisers, also agencies, I think, like yourself, to see where are we investing? Are we putting everything in paid media, or do we need more orchestration services in tech and so forth? And my worry is that this fragmentation is going to move away money from paid media um, into other things that might not necessarily contribute uh, to local ecosystems. Yeah, um, and we were obviously talking earlier about so the report, it. and uh, you know, it makes that, that measurement so much more challenging as, the, as it does fragment as well. So getting a really true view of what's happening within the industry becomes, becomes more challenging, but more interesting. And do you both see this uh, exponential growth just as the uh, rebound from COVID-19 slump? Exactly. Again, I think that the kind of fragmentation there is, is another really interesting point because, it, you know, I wouldn't think that we would describe the e-commerce growth as a, as a COVID slump, for example. So, you know, if you think about it in, in that respect, there are structural changes that have benefited some parts of, of the industry and some of those are here to stay and some of those less so. You know, if you think about Shoppable, for example, QR codes have not been particularly popular. Uh, in Europe, and you know, we've long, long looked at case studies um, from China on, on how popular they are and how they drive e-commerce there, and they just haven't ever landed here. And I think that the change in our, in, in us going to restaurants and, and looking at a menu using a QR code is here to stay. Um, for some parts of the industry, if you think about streaming services and, and some of the results there, you know, there, there is going to be a shift and a, and a rebalancing, I think, but, but clearly the way we view um, video on demand has changed mm. forever. I think we'll see some, some rebalancing. Um, but yeah, I mean, of course, extraordinary growth. There's, there's no question extraordinary growth, but extraordinary growth from a year that saw growth. And I think we have to you know, keep it within that context. Daniel, you share this point of view? Um, when I look at e-commerce statistics, um, I'm a bit worried for the short term, but optimistic for the mid and long term. Uh, I think we saw an overinvestment, an oversurge in e-commerce advertising in 2020, and even in 2021, um, where now, also with Apple's ATT changes, um, smaller businesses are not seeing the return on, uh, on investment. And we're seeing on the back of the e-commerce e model, businesses being built that kind of have baked these channels in. They have customer acquisition through particular types of advertising as a business model. When that doesn't really work anymore, the question is what ROI does, what ROI does the spend have? We're also seeing consumers change going back to brick and mortar. If we look at Germany, France, UK statistics on e-commerce, e they haven't just plateaued, but they're going down again. So we have to keep e-commerce based ad spend up from a lower relative level of retail expenditure. The good news, I think, is that these two years have fast forwarded, not, just, not the ad spend, that's not the important thing, but the creation of an infrastructure of e-commerce, which can now be easier played by companies as measurement changes, as the macro environment changes than before. So I think, in a sense, the e-commerce went kind of from construction side to real infrastructure, and that's going to remain. And those investments are also not going to be drawn out because a lot of the e-commerce investments are also software as a service contracts, which are, have like 48 month or even longer cycles. So you can't just pull the plug entirely. So this is the second time you tell us how optimistic you are. First time was during your presentation when you were talking about the forecast of 2022. Are you as optimistic? <laughs> I mean, after a record 2021 and with this week macro landscape, do you think that the growth can go any further? Yeah, I mean, we're forecasting growth at Group M and WPP um, for this year. And I think our figures are, are similar to the ones shared in the report, which is always nice. Um, I think clearly, you know, what we've seen is that there are, there are areas of hyper growth 
within the digital advertising industry. So, it, you know, growth is not equal everywhere. Um, I think we'll continue to see hyper growth through the, some of the social platforms, but potentially not the largest. And, and like, let's not forget that even, you know, with things like e-commerce, I think um, Meta uh, released some figures last week, and, and they're still seeing growth. So, you know, 41% growth in Q1 last year, 10% growth in Q1 this year. We're talking about phenomenal bases in terms of the sizes of, of these businesses. So, you know, whilst we have seen, you know, it, extreme growth in the last two years, we're still going to grow, and we're growing from those bases. So, yes, very optimistic. Okay. And who did um, benefit the most of uh, this exponential growth, uh, the large platform, I guess, but what else? Who else? I think that's the obvious answer, but um, as, as we saw in the data, um, that was, you know, this, the gap between who benefits and who doesn't, that was mainly in 2020. I think 2020 was a year where everybody was in panic mode and one reverted to the nearest life vest. And many of the self-serve platforms, large scale, were exactly those. Um, we've seen the gap between the platforms and others, like programmatic, um, close over time, which I think is a signal um, that growth is happening elsewhere and that buyers are looking for other opportunities. That, of course, has to do with the inherent business models of um, those who manage spend, but it has also to do with, I think, many brands that came into the digital world in 2020 adopting more mature strategies as they're wondering, what's really the ROI of my spend? I've you know, pumped all that cash into, into systems, maybe with just a very, very technical mindset, and now I have a business and I need to be more strategic about this. Do you think that digital advertising market is now cannibalizing the world market? Uh, you mentioned the Group M report, uh, you said it's right, and that digital ad rose to account for 64.4% of world advertising markets? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say um, there is, um, you know, it's clearly, it's clearly growing quickly. I think around the major platforms, they've gone from 40% of total industry in 2019 to 50% last year. So, you know, they're, they're, clearly, they're clearly winning on that. I think the other thing we need to think about is, are the structural changes within, within the industry and how much of those things you're capturing within these types of reports. So we're seeing a proliferation of digitization across traditional media channels or, or more traditional media um, channels. And as we start to capture those within reports like this, I would expect to see that. So clearly video on demand growing incredibly quickly and making seismic changes in terms of the, the um, you know, AV industry as a, as a whole, but also digitization of out of home and radio and cinema in some of our markets and the ability to programmatically purchase and that's what we'll, re we'll really see the change so cannibalization i'm not so sure i think it's just a, a, it's a shift in terms of where we see digital showing up within some um some established industries you want to add something maybe daniel I think over the last years we've seen a dual trends of um, cannibalization of budgets moving into digital, but they're always not moving one to one. There's usually a digital discount that's being applied. So let's say from every euro that moves from, let's say, the broadly traditional media, and I think it's a bit of a misnomer because there's a, lot, there's a lot of innovation there as well. But from every of these euros, maybe only 80, 80 cent or so go into digital. So it's a cannibalization that benefits digital, but it doesn't really necessarily benefit the overall ecosystem because there's less of it there. At the same time, there are new advertisers coming in that haven't been there before. And um, if you think of many of these, I think you also call it, which I think is a great name, uh, the digital endemics, um, uh, um, um, large venture, venture fueled companies with 100-something you know, percent revenue growth and marketing growth exceeding this. This is entirely this is net new money coming into the market that is not coming through cannibalization. Again, how long that party lasts is a different question, but um, there are these two forces of cannibalization and new money. Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting point, actually, because when you see those, those new businesses coming in that are digital first, and often digital only in their advertising, over time you would expect that there will be a shift the other way for, for those brands as they move into other areas of the, the kind of media landscape. 
You're talking about new businesses, and we are going to talk about two of them during the day. Uh, retail media, for example, and CTV. Um, how fast do you see, we know that many marketers are keen to go to CTV advertising, yeah. but how fast do you see, see that coming? Um, I think it's, it's one of the areas that is, is very fragmented. So lots of the trends that we've been looking at today are around businesses that are digital first, digital only, and global or have the ability to be global. And that's where that growth comes from. I think when you look at things like CTV, you're talking about often quite fragmented marketplaces, particularly within Europe. Um, and therefore, I think it's about how quickly within each of those markets the, the technology is there to be able to do that. But certainly from a UK perspective, that area of, of the industry is growing incredibly quickly. Um, as with all of these things, it's about quality of data and access to data. Um, and I think we're in a really good place there and, and overcome some of the challenges that we see with some of the wall gardens and, and some of the things that you were, you were talking about earlier. So I think um, Connected TV is definitely one, one to watch. I would say that um, we'll see some, some shifts in, in terms of pricing, making that more accessible um, as, as we move. And actually, I think that's one of the big opportunities for those new into um, advertising in its entirety brands that are digital only currently, I think that's where we will see them go next because they're used to having that data and they, and they want to start unlocking some different audiences. So I think there's big opportunity, but really focused on how good the technology is and how quickly it rolls out. How quickly did it roll of course. Yeah, Daniel. CTV, we've been asking for CTV data in our ADEC study for a number Sorry. of years. Sorry, I think we've got a little issue with the sound. Yes, yes. Can you still hear me? Now, yes. Good. We've asked for CTV data in our ADEC study for a number of years and um, have gotten back just a little trickle of data, not much. And I think it just confirms also that there's a huge gap between PowerPoint and practice of this market, in particular in Europe. Um, large US marketing machines kind of pumping, particularly kind of programmatic CTV. That's not necessarily happening right now in Europe. The market is still incredibly tiny. It's also, as rightly as you mentioned, I think it's a local market. But also, but fundamentally, new questions need to be explored. If you're watching something on a smart TV, who owns the customer? Is it the smart TV manufacturer? Is it the OS provider? Is it the broadcaster? Is it the, um, is it the app that you're, um, that you're watching? Very, very hard to say. And then, I think as many rush in the CTV space, it's also an empty term. Um, which everyone loads up with meaning depending on what their business model is. So there needs to be synthetization and really clarity on the buy side. What is it that CTV is? What am I buying? Am I buying a banner overlay? Am I buying a streaming ad? Am I being a substitutional linear TV ad, etc.? This is all very, very fragmented. I think lots of things have happened, need, need to happen. But I think it's important that it works. Um, uh, we're seeing, of course, broadcaster collaboration and consolidation across Europe. Um, and I think another phase will come. I remember in Spain, we had uh, uh, when uh, the uh, DV was uh, the um, di digital terrestrial license was done, we had La Sexta and Cuatro, but they had to merge with Telecinco and Antenna because the, the market was too small. And I think increasingly we need this massive scale collaboration as well in the CTV world, at least in national markets, if not on a European scale to make it viable and also to have a European alternative to some um, other platforms. Yeah. I would love to hear the audience. Uh, do any of you have a question for our speakers? Yeah, I, yeah we've got some microphone coming. If you can introduce yourself. Maybe. Hi, I'm Oliver. Um, I'm with Next Statista. Daniel, I was wondering whether war effects are already built in into your forecast. Likely the data collection has been completed before February 24th. So will you re-forecast throughout the year? Because apparently, yeah, consumption is getting more defensive in, 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 yeah. in single markets right now. There, there will be further effects the longer it takes. So how, how will you act on that, on that? Um, <clears throat> apart from the <laughs> obviously incredibly optimistic forecast that Russia give, gave you, which uh, <laughs> that valuably is uh, cal calculated out? Yeah, so Russia, we're thinking that's like going to tank around 60% the ad market there. Um, um, overall, Europe, uh, as I said, 10.1 is our forecast. Indeed, it's, it's, it's optimistic. 
Um, I think it still, it still holds up, but you're absolutely right. One needs to reforecast constantly. And again, forecasts are um, opinions backed by data. They are not fact. Um, and I think it's always important to check different opinions. Um, forecasts, I'd say, it's, it's a mixture between science and voodoo. You need gut feeling and data to make a decision that you bake into the forecast. Um, one huge problem that we have is that a lot of the economic indicators, they are lagging. They're lagging um, at least a month, or if you look at the IMF or other economic institutes publishing data, it's often with a six, six, you know, in, in, in a six-month cadence. As we know, a lot can happen within six months. One thing that I found interesting is there are faster indicators. Um, one thing that I really like is the um, Economic Policy Uncertainty Index, for instance, which is something that's updated daily, which scans how policymakers and politicians agree on the, on the economic outlook as reflected, for instance, in the news and so forth, and then it's being translated into uh, economic indicators. We're increasingly using that kind of stuff to see whether, whether there are changes. But the vision remains very, very foggy. Um, we can't see very far, so checking, constantly validating things is important. But we strive to, I think, at least every three months um, provide an update via IAB Europe to, to what's going on. And um, I would invite opinions from other forecasters, from other experts, what's going on, because um, it's also hard to predict the exact impact of an economic environment on digital ads. We've seen that digital ads can be completely detached from what's, from what's happening in the economic world. So, um, yeah, lots of checking to be done. Any other question? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, Alberto Rossasso from Nielsen. A question for both uh, Daniel and Lisa. Um, I've seen that you, you mentioned that uh, audio, for instance, is growing a lot in the digital, in the digital environment. Um, and post podcast as well. Uh, I I would like to to know your opinion about the changing of way of uh, you know of measurement. The audience can affect or help these business to grow. So there's a lot of changing in the digital side, even in the uh, audience measurement. What do you think about this changing and uh, related to the advertising growth? Is that you want to go first? Yeah, can I just clarify that the, the question was around the changes in audience measurement and how you think that will help the industry to grow? Yeah, uh, I mean, especially talking about audio, especially so podcasts, for instance, uh, and on the other side, the changing with, uh, related to the uh, uh, cookie apocalypse, uh, the new uh, way of measurement, the uh, Total audience TV, for instance, including including connected TV, linear TV, this kind, this uh, this kind of types. Yeah. Okay. That's super challenging. You know, that, that, that's that's the reality. Um, you know, we're we're dealing with uh, incredibly visible data and some less visible data. So, um, to use your phrase, it's a bit foggy sometimes when we're trying to to um, to really gain a picture. And I think you know we have to be honest about the fact that we've struggled with cross-platform measurement of of audience for that reason, and, and that the the metrics are not always like for like. I think it's something that the industry has has been challenged with with for a number of years. Um, I think the second part of your your question is really interesting, and that's around, um, and to your point about connected TV, what are we measuring when we're talking about audience, particularly when you're talking about audience uh, and environments that aren't necessarily one-to-one? -one. And if, you know, think about what I was saying earlier about the growth in, in other areas that are becoming digital, those are not one-to-one -one connections, and the industry is going through a big shift and you know we haven't talked about privacy and all of those things but though you know that clearly makes it um, more challenging to get a view of the audience so have we got the right answer yet i would say no um i think there are lots of very smart people working very hard on it and you know from a from an agency perspective a, an enormous part of our job now and an enormous part of our job moving forwards is to help our clients to understand that but is there going to be a a, you know, a single measurement for all of these things that, you know, highly, highly unlikely given, given the attempts that we've had 
to date, I would say. I'm not expert on measurement, but I mean, measurement often fulfills different functions. Um, it wants to make inventory, advertising inventory, palatable and um, measurable, yes. Um, but it also often serves proprietary purposes to push the value of what is being sold. So, and because that's there, there will always be different ways of measuring things. And we have so many different um, um, tasks and purposes that digital ads are being used for, um, that is very hard to do. Um, but I think one important thing is you, 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 you mentioned cookies and the different approaches that of course could be um, an entirely different conference. But there's going to be this spectrum of, of identifiability, logged in users, and then there will be anonymous users um, uh, in groups. Depends on the advertiser, but I think what's often missed in the debate is that we always think of one-on-one -on -one advertising. And I think we as an industry have been often taught that this is what we should be doing. Ten years of Demexco, I think, have uh, um, you know, brainwashed some in the industry that this is really how it has to go. But if you think about advertisers, they're not interested in me or you necessarily. They're often interested in us as expressions of a cohort, of us as expressions of a statistical distribution. And I think it's very sensible that approaches are being developed to understand audiences better in that way than to kind of force feed the one-on-one -on -one connections. Another related question would be how does the ADEX study need to evolve to capture future growth trends? And same for WWPP because you are also running your own survey, as we mentioned. Yeah, yeah we do. Um, I, I think there's a couple of things here. What, what really stood out for me in the report is just how you see those new and emerging areas coming through and they're relatively small and you talked about you know the, the the penetration of audio at the moment being relatively small and then you see how quickly those things grow so i think always horizon scanning and, and seeing where the, where those things are are coming from is really important i think influencer is one of those uh, you know i think that that industry was worth something like two billion dollars globally uh three or four years ago it's 15 billion dollars this year predicted this year um so you know and, and that will continue to grow. I think the challenge with that, and back to the measurement point, is then how do you continue to, to collect that information when the route to market is not traditional mm -hmm. anymore? Um, and I think that's, that's going to be a challenge moving forward with these types of reports. Yeah, I think there, are, there are many challenges with them, number one. I'd love them to get ready earlier, not the night before. But <laughs> um, on a serious note, um, I think the market is much bigger then um, we can make it out in this study. Um, when we look at the social figures that we, that we presented, there are just, sh you know, dep depends on the currency exchange, but just shy of what uh, Meta actually reported as their own revenue for Europe um, um, in the last reports. So we're probably missing quite a bit of the long tail that's going on, that isn't coming through lo in local methodologies, that even if we estimate things, um, um, we can't ac accurately attribute to specific countries. So we need to get better at understanding the long tail. Um, I also think that Amazon isn't entirely reflected in the study. Um, we saw some, which was very interesting, some IABs break out retail media data specifically. Um, we want to build that into it. Um, and then other things, blurring boundaries of marketing and advertising, um, as you know, budget pools are becoming increasingly unclear. These are things that we want to develop. But one thing is clear, it has to be done more on modeling and estimations and, uh, and other things than on surveys. Because while well, they give important context and opinion, um, they typically miss out chunks of the market. Challenging future. Any other questions from the audience? Yes? Um, I'm Olga from MyPinWeb. Um, I will entertain you with a bit of a legacy question. Um, I think everybody have noticed that digital out of home with, um, after pandemic has exploded um, in the recent quarters. Uh, do you expect it to grow? And I think that's more a quick question to Daniel. Uh, while I have a more tricky question to Lisa, um, digital out of home is not really a programmatic format but it is always have a tendency to go programmatic and there are 
different types of measurements and how we can uh, calculate this conversion for the digital out of home display. There are tons of people in front of this display in New York. So do you think, first, it will grow as fast as it was growing after the pandemic? And second, do you expect it to go more programmatic and more um, or to be based as opposed to being a traditional format with all this kind of stuff? Thanks. Okay, yeah, I can go first. Um, so uh, I think your first question was, do we, do we expect to see it growing as quickly post-pandemic? I think it will grow faster. Um, you know, we saw a real dip in out-of-home advertising in general throughout the pandemic um, because many of our markets were experiencing lockdowns and therefore clients felt that uh, they were wanted to move on to other platforms and, and, and digital definitely benefited from that. So I think it will, it will grow faster. Um, you know, measurement is challenging from an out-of-home perspective anyway because it's a very public media. And there are some really good solutions. Um, out there. I think um, from a UK perspective, they have um, an audience measurement tool called Root. And also, when we start talking about digitizing out of home and, and programmatic buying, which we are doing, actually, we, we do buy out of home digital in a programmatic way. The challenge there is just around how do we find uh, our audience in real time. So the industry is built on modeled data from an out-of-home perspective. Um, that, that has always been true. The data's got better and is refreshed more frequently, but it, it's still modeled. So I think there's, there's a, a difference in how you would expect measurement from a programmatic perspective in, in traditional digital channels versus out of home. I, I think the upside that advertisers will see from moving into that market, however, is, is, is one, the ability to buy as part of a digital cross-channel campaign in, in many areas, including um, connected TV, including video on demand, including digitized radio, for example. Um, but you also will get the benefits beyond the, the, you know, the Im impacts that you're seeking. So there's always been that halo effect from out of home. And I think that's the really interesting thing is, how do you, in a, in a programmatic world, still benefit from, from some of the traditional brand building aspects of some of those media channels? But yeah, I think, I think the infrastructure and having the, the enough sites and the digital availability will vary by market, but it's gonna continue to, to grow and, and faster than we've seen in the last two years, undoubtedly. I think out of home, uh, in a sense, is it I'm glad you asked, um, because we're not covering it in, in, in our study. It's always which industry associations owns the topic, and that varies a lot across, across European markets. But it is, a, it is a digital medium. It's connected to, it's connected to, uh, um, to other channels, as you can say, you, you can buy it programmatically. But what's really, I think, appealing about digital out of home is that you can't really fragment the audience. You can fragment the media buying, you can uh, fragment it into different silos, but the the audience that's passing by in the urban landscape can't be, can't be fragmented. So in that sense, you know, one hypothesis could be like it's the, it's the, it's the last ma mass medium that will ever be there. So I think that, that, makes, it quite, that makes it quite attractive. When, when we you know, analyze um, out of home, digital out of home advertising growth, the patterns are very different to other media, in particular as more and more out of home sites are being put on um, or existing sites are being converted. So growth isn't as smooth as you have in other media. You have to get this kind of spike, you know, new installed base of screen, bam, massive growth. But then um, if you don't add new screen, it kind of stalls over time. So um, it's very, very different patterns of growth. And I find that makes it very hard uh, to, very hard to forecast. Thank you very much for your question. And thank you for the other questions. We are running out of time. So maybe, do you want to conclude? Is there any insight you want to add to all of those Daniel shared with us from WPP Survey or from your own <coughs> actual point of view? I mean, I think, um, I think the question earlier around are, are we being over-optimistic is, is quite an interesting one. And I think, um, you know, the, the figures, we actually release our report next month. And uh, I'm not allowed to talk about it. But our, our next one will come out uh, in June. Uh, I think we'll see very similar trends. And that obviously gives comfort, because we are interpreting the data in, in similar ways. I think there's a, a, just an enormous amount of opportunity. I think clearly there are you know, geopolitical challenges, and we're very aware of that. 
I think one of the things that was, was really striking was the, you know, the inflation numbers in Turkey and what that, that's done to investment within, within that market. And I think we will see some of that this year and, and then into 2023 is going to be a, a very interesting shift. But um, probably not a very controversial answer, but, but I, saw lots, I saw lots in the report that, that we're also seeing, which, which is uh, giving me comfort. Good. Thank you very much to both of you. Maybe we can applaud them for this Thank super you. inspiring <laughs> opening talk. Thank you very much.